Put it dry by brush. You said it's in the shower. Into the next one. Let us prepare our hearts for worship by joining together on our responsive call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Lent calls us to journey this and every day, following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls, calls us to journey to the place where God covenants with us to receive the new names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together, to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to practice justice, to bring God's hope to all people. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life. Lent calls each of us to take up our cross, to trust the one who bears it with us. Lent calls us to journey with God. Let us worship God who walks with us this and every day. Please join me in prayer. A God of hope and joy, we come into your presence today with hearts grateful for your love and faithfulness. We humbly offer this time of praise and prayer that you might be lifted up, glorified, and that we might be strengthened to be your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. As you are able, let us stand together and sing hymn number 276, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
ask to take stock of our own lives, to recognize we've fallen short in being the people God has called us to be. And in admitting the truth of our lives, we take the first step towards wholeness and healing. Friends, let us make our confession as the children of God, trusting in God's grace and mercy in our, by saying the words of our unison prayer of confession. God of all the saints, God of all the sinners, hear our prayers. We would be saint-like, holy, good, patient, loving, but we end up feeling more like sinners, full of failures, immorality, selfish, mean. Perhaps you see us as simply human, as the loved and flawed, and trying and failing and succeeding. In all of this, forgive the wrong we have done. Bless the good we have accomplished. We thank you, God, that you continue to love us and help us and mold us more and more into the image of Christ. Almighty God, hear us now as we each offer our own silent prayers of confession. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. The love of God is beyond measure, and every one of us are included in that love. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are loved and accepted. We are empowered to serve God and one another. Thanks be to our triune God. Alleluia. Amen. Let us stand together for the glory of God.
Please join me in the prayer of the nation. God of wisdom, grace, and mercy, grant that the word you speak to us this, this day may take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is Genesis 17, 1 through 7, as well as verses 15 and 16. Listen to God's word. When Abram was 99, 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. I will make, then I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Thank you, Gerard. And from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. Here, Paul is using Abraham, Abraham as an example to the church at Rome. God promised Abraham and his descendants that he would give him the world. This promise wasn't made because Abraham obeyed the law, but because his faith in God made him acceptable. If Abraham and his descendants were given this promise because they had obeyed the law, then faith would mean nothing, and the promise would be worthless. God becomes angry when his law is broken, but when there isn't a law, it cannot be broken. Everything depends on having faith in God, so that God's promise is assured by his gift of undeserved grace. This promise isn't for only for Abraham's descendants who have the law. It is for all who are Abraham's descendants because they have faith, just as he did. Abraham is the ancestor of us all. The scriptures say that Abraham would become the ancestor of many nations. This promise was made to Abraham because he had faith in God, who raises the dead to life and creates new things. God promised Abraham a lot of descendants, and when it all seemed hopeless, Abraham still had faith in God and became the ancestor of many nations. Abraham's faith never became weak, not even when he was nearly 100 years old. He knew that he was almost dead and that his wife Sarah could not have children, but Abraham never doubted or questioned God's promise. His faith made him strong and he gave all the credit to God. Abraham was certain that God could do what he had promised, so God accepted him just as we read in the scriptures. But these words were not written only for Abraham, they were written for us, since we also will be accepted because of our faith in God, who raised our Lord Jesus to life. God gave Jesus to die for our sins, and he raised him to life so that we would be made acceptable to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. (coughs) 
Our opening hymn this morning was Great is Thy Faithfulness, a favorite of many folks. And it should be a favorite. It could be a prayer of gratitude for each of us to God. The hymn is a reminder and a beautiful expression of God's unchanging faithfulness. Faithfulness is about trust and loyalty and consistent obedience both towards God and towards one another in our relationships with each other. <clears throat> the author of the text was a man by the name of Thomas Chisholm. He was born in Franklin, Kentucky back in 1866. He didn't have a high school education, he didn't have any college, yet he was still able to get enough education that he could become a school teacher at age 16, and then later in life he entered into the newspaper business. Some years later, found him an ordained pastor, but poor health forced him to leave the ministry, and after a time of recovery in New Jersey, he began to work as an insurance agent. But he was a prolific poet, and so Chisholm had sent a collection of his poems in 1923 to his good friend William Runyon, a musician associated with Chicago's Moody Bible Institute, who also worked for a hymn publishing company. And so Ryan leaped through these poems and was immediately taken by the text, the depth of meaning and the lyrical beauty of the poem, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Years later, Ryan would recall, this particular poem had such an appeal that I prayed most earnestly that the tune might carry over its message in a worthy way. Out of Chisholm's simple prayer, out of his simple prayer, Ryan's melody took shape and the completed hymn was published that same year. Now, due to Ryan's association with the Moody Bible Institute, Great Is Thy Faithfulness became a favorite with the students and the faculty there, and became the Institute's unofficial college hymn. But the hymn was kind of slow to catch on across the United States. It wasn't until Billy Graham started using it in its crusades, in his crusades, that it really took hold, at least in America. Looking back on the writing of the hymn, the text, the author Chisholm recalled, my income has not been large at any time due to my poor health in the earlier years which has followed me until now. Although I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant keeping God, and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his provided care, for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. So in spite of Chisholm's many challenges, he experienced God's faithfulness throughout his life. It is God's faithfulness and promise which are also central to Abraham's story. In both of our scripture passages today, underscore God's faithfulness, the promises that God made to Abram, who became Abraham, the promise to make Abram the father of a great nation, to give that nation a land of its own, and then to bring great blessings to the world through that nation. The promise, God's promise to Abraham had three distinct parts. Promise of land, promise of a seed promise, and a blessing promise. Now if you remember the order of the book of Genesis, this promise was first made to Abraham when God called him to leave his country for a land that God would show him. That would be back in Genesis 12. And then again, when Egypt, in Egypt, after Abraham and his nephew Lot separated, God said to Abram again, I will give you and your family all the land you can see. It will be theirs forever. I will give you more descendants than there are specks of dust on the earth. And someday it will be easier to count those specks of dust than to count your descendants. And that was in chapter 13. So here we are in chapter 17, and the promise is again repeated to Abraham that he will be the father of a great nation, that that nation will be given a land of its own, and that there will be great blessing to come to the world through that nation. So this was the third time God had given this promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. He was still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. In Paul's letter to the Church of Rome, he offers up Abraham as an exemplar of a faithful believer. 
Abraham was honored by all of his descendants as one who had worshipped God even in the midst of idolatrous people. Now, some might say that Paul glossed over Abraham's imperfections because at the time of our gospel chapter uh, reading from Romans, Abraham was 99 years old. It's been 24 years since he and Sarah left Earth. Abraham and Sarah wavered maybe a little bit in their conviction that God was going to fulfill a promise at this point. 24 years is a long time. So the pair took matters into their own hands. And the scriptures tell us that Abram has one child, Ishmael, which was conceived with Hagar, Sarah's maid. Now Abraham did waver in those years in seeing God's vision and trusting in God's promises. And the scriptures also tell us that those choices he made had human consequences, one of which was the banishment of Hagar and Ishmael from the camp, and also the encounter in Egypt with the Pharaoh and Sarah. And you can read about that in like chapter 13. But ultimately, Abram's faith in God was rightly placed because God did eventually do what God had promised. Abraham and Sarah had that child. And also, this is evidenced by the changing of Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah and the arrival of Isaac. All of these things marked a new phase in their lives for both of them. Paul was emphasizing to the church at Rome that Paul, excuse me, that Abraham believed in a God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. That would be a reference to the creation story in Genesis. And it also alludes to the experience of Abraham and Sarah in being given this son of promise, Isaac. As you recall, from a reproductive point of view, Sarah and Abraham were dead reproductively at 190. He was 100, she was 90. Can you imagine what, what the maternity award would be like with a 100-year-old father and a 90-year-old mother wandering around? So indeed, just like in our story of Jesus' birth with Zachariah and Elizabeth being coming parents at an old age, this was a cause for celebration. It was a cause for laughter. And Sarah and Abraham named their child Isaac, which means he laughs. In the letter to the Romans, Paul makes three points about God's promises to Abraham. First, the promise is based on faith, not keeping the law. Because salvation is by grace through faith, it is guaranteed to all of Abraham's descendants, and not just the physical descendants of Abraham, but all, even the spiritual offspring. And second, because God's promise is based on faith, it unites all people, whether they be Jews or Gentiles, all people are God's people. And finally, the faith with which Abraham responded to God's promise was firm, maybe a little wavering, but still he trusted in God. And scriptures remind us over and over again, when God says something will happen, it happens, even if it might seem impossible to us. But it's not always on our timeline either. And this is true for the past, the present, and the future. When God makes a promise, it will happen. And so God is right here promising a new hope and new life, as we see detailed in Abraham and Sarah's story. Abraham's life gives us an example of God's faithfulness, how God cares for us. God leads us into new lands and new experiences, that God loves us, that God is faithful to us, and Abraham's life also illustrates the faithfulness that we need to have to God, which means trusting and believing in God's care and leading, obeying God's commandments and following the path laid out for us, and responding to God's love with devotion. Faithfulness affects every relationship we have, whether it be between spouses or friends or our faith community or our employers. It requires remaining true to our commitments 
It requires, requires a stick to itiveness, whether it be to God or to one another. Each of us should show the same faithfulness in our relationship to others that we have been shown by God. But we know Abraham, who was the great hero of Scripture, was a human being. He was like us. He sometimes got lost in his worries. He wondered if he needed to take things into his own, hand, own hands to make his own way in the world rather than wait on God. Still, God didn't just love Abraham because he doubted occasionally. God loved Abraham through his doubts and through his worries and through his concerns. So we are reminded that faithfulness isn't about being unwavering in faith, but rather being willing to bring our worries to God, to confess when we're unsure, and to trust that the love of God is greater than our own insecurities about whatever God has promised to us. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians in chapter 2, he writes, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. What Paul is promising to his readers in Romans is that our faithfulness to God combined with God's grace to us and faith in Jesus Christ offers us the same righteousness that Abraham received. In order to be made right with God, we must believe that God will make good on God's promises of salvation for all who believe. And when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we receive also the Holy Spirit which dwells within us and brings us the blessings of love and joy and peace and embodies faithfulness in our lives. Perhaps it's like being renamed and given a new phase of life and that we're ready to go out into the world, filled with the Spirit, ready to share in word and deed what God has done, what God is doing in our lives. God calls each of us to believe in his word, to walk by faith in good times and in challenging times. And so the question for you today is will you take God's, God in his word, like Abraham, and join in singing and speaking of God's great faithfulness as well as trusting and living into God's faithfulness. May it be so for each of us. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Our hymn is number 399. Stand as you are able. We walk by faith, not by sight.
Please be seated. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, our hope and holy companion, we come before you knowing we can be honest because you know us. You know our thoughts, our struggles, our joys. You know our prayers even before they form in our minds and become whispered or spoken. Oh God, we need you as the thirsty deer longs for the flowing stream. Our souls thirst for you. Our hearts ache for your love. Our minds want to be assured without a doubt of your presence among us and with us. Oh God, in these wilderness days of Lent, we ask for your help and for your hope. We ask for comfort for the sick and the grieving. We ask especially for prayers for the Johnson family and the Dinsmore family in the difficult days that they are experiencing. May they feel your presence of the Spirit guiding and uplifting them. We pray, Almighty God, for those who are dealing with wounds of heart and body. We pray for those who are experiencing failing health and perhaps disease. We pray for all afflictions of body and soul, those that can be seen and those that are visible only to you, God. We pray, Almighty God, for the comfort of the Holy Spirit for those who grieve this day. O oh God, open our eyes to your still small ways of working beauty and awe into the chaos of the world, whether it be in the bump of a bee's head onto a window pane, the spring crocus that's begun its journey out of the dark soil, or the heavens ablaze with the pink, red, and orange of your glory in a morning sunset, morning sunrise or a sunset. Or the reminders through others, the squeeze of a hand, the kindness of a smile, and an encouraging note that we aren't alone in these difficult days. We give thanks for the grace that you make readily available to us when we are ready to receive it. Try, God, our spirits cry for relief from the chaos around us and in the world. It seems that the struggles of the world have opened a hole that seems impossible to close. And so, Lord, we pray for peace in the world. We pray that violence will cease, that bombs will stop, that the hearts of leaders will be softened, to see that not everything and everyone is something to be feared or destroyed. Oh God, we pray for the order and the chaos which swirls around us, that it might become stilled, that we might again see beauty and silence and give thanks for peace. Oh God, we pray that you come near us on this Sunday, near to those we love and hold dear in our hearts. We pray that you will stay with us, Almighty God, that you will hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, that you will hear the prayer that we pray as Jesus has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we give thanks for God's faithfulness in our lives, and God calls us to lives of grateful generosity. Today we praise the giver of all good gifts, and we return to God's service a portion of the gifts we have received to be used for God's service. The offering box is at the back of the, on the back table. So let us stand together for our doxology and closing hymn.
Please join me in the unison prayer of dedication as printed in your bulletin. God of grace, you provide for us in amazing ways. May our offerings provide for others and be used to further Christ's ministry and mission. Amen. Our closing hymn is My Faith Looks Up to Thee. It's number 383. And now receive the benediction. May the love of God, the gracious Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Alleluia. Amen. Thank you.